evening. I'd like to receive or transfer the final speaker of the evening. Thank you for attending this evening's keynote address. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the S3RC keynote speaker, Mr. Lucian Greaves. Lucian is a national spokesperson and co-founder of the Satanic Temple, an international religious organization steadfastly committed to the promotion of secular ideals, including the separation of church and state, bodily sovereignty, and rationality. The Satanic Temple is based in Salem, Massachusetts, with chapters across North America, including Pensacola, Florida, and Europe. Among the many projects Lucian is spearheading is Great Faction, a sub-organization of the Satanic Temple dedicated to combating irrational, conspiracy theory-based moral panics, modern witch hunts, and the discredited therapeutic practices that still haunt us from beyond the formally recognized Satanic Panic era. Please join me in welcoming this keynote speaker for the second annual SVRC, Mr. Lucian Greaves. Hello. I'm honored to accept my honorary doctorate from the University of Western Florida today. <laughs> However, I wasn't really sure what we were supposed to be talking about today. Uh, Mr. Hood expressed some concern when he called and asked if I wanted to speak here that I simply said yes. Uh, but So I kind of decided that I will talk about what I want to. Sorry if it's not exactly what might have been expected. Uh, you know us from our secular church state campaigns, putting up Baphomet, the uh, children's books where the religious books are being put out in the public forum of the schools. But um, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, about a project we work on, kind of on the side, that doesn't get as much press attention. Um, here was an article from 2016, last year, Satanists Infiltrate a Ritual Abuse Conference in Oakland, Your Guide to What Happened and Why, written by Religious Dispatches out of Annenberg University of California. The article is in the format of a Q&A, because it's a confusing topic, and it says, who goes to an event like this, uh, speaking about ritual abuse mind control conferences? And it says, some people believe they have suffered abuse they cannot remember, have alternate personalities of which they are unaware, or have even committed crimes they cannot recall, all because of sadistic rituals inflicted on them as a form of mind control. Who do they think is responsible for this psychological abuse? The usual suspects include unnamed cults, the CIA, and an alleged conspiracy of organized criminal Satanists. And the article goes on and says, and then actual Satanists showed up? Yes, they did. <laughs> Amidst all this paranoia, Satanists actually had infiltrated the conference, and they recently went public with the reason why. In a twist worthy of a bad M. Night Shyamalan film, the Satanists claim that they are the ones exposing a dangerous cabal, and that it is the conference organizers who are abusing their patients. And the important thing to know here is that these aren't just fringe lunatics putting out these satanic panic ideas and trying to cause a witch hunt. These are, for the most part, licensed mental health counselors, uh, people who work in the field of mental health. There's this theory put forward in this crowd that dissociative identity disorder, which was previously known as multiple personality disorder, is actually part of a larger conspiracy, that it's not simply caused by child abuse, and the empirical evidence doesn't really match up to this at all, and in fact, the, the theory of multiple personality is, is rife with, with problems. It's very problematic. Uh, the theory behind multiple personality disorder is that some trauma, particularly childhood trauma, is so horrific and incomprehensible that memories of their occurrence are repressed, relegated to some dark corner of the mind outside of the immediate consciousness where they develop new, alternate, alter personalities of their own. And now this sounds intuitive in a culture wherein this premise has served as a well-worn dramatic plot device, but it doesn't stand up to scientific scrutiny. While proponents of DID theory currently like to claim that the condition lies somewhere on the post-traumatic stress disorder spectrum, it's been pointed out again and again that the hallmark of PTSD is involuntary intrusive recollection of traumatic experiences, not selective and protective amnesia. And while the existence for repressed trauma, often alleged to 
stem from long-term episodic extreme child abuse is dubious at best. There's still no reliable evidence that DID would even result from such trauma. Uh, the evidence supported, uh, cited to support those claims of DID's relationship to childhood trauma primarily come from self-reports of the DID diagnosed. Uh, but if the memories have been repressed, how can they report on something they have entirely redacted from their minds? Often hypnosis and other mem memory retrieval techniques are employed to draw forth what is presumed to be accessible in the subconscious mind. Unfortunately, this digging for repressed memories can serve to create false memories that almost always conform to the assumptions held by the therapist, and sometimes those therapists are very delusional, as we will see. The, uh, the theory put forward by those who go to a ritual abuse mind control conference is that DID isn't just some accidental byproduct of traumatic abuse, but that there is a criminal cabal working to induce people into a state of multiple personalities with trauma-based mind control techniques. That is to say that they are intentionally abusing people so as to split their personalities off into different alters, and those personalities will contain various programs by which that person will act upon whatever commands are given, uh, triggers in the way of uh, gestures, color codes, uh, hidden signals, or whatever else will draw forth these, these functions. This is a video from when Gray Faction went to a conference. Uh, we sent a couple people to this mind control conference. This was the conference in question in the, uh, the religion dispatches piece. This is the organizer of the conference that you'll see in the video. And he's, he's expressing concern that people who are touching their faces will trigger mind control programs in other people surrounding them. Oh, you have to back up one. I continue to educate the public about child abuse, trauma, and ritual abuse of crime. Um, safety things. Um, you know, one big thing is try not to go to your face at all. Um, brush your hair, touch your glasses, anything. Those can be construed as triggers every year. We, not not every year, but a lot of times we have trouble with those things. If you have an itchy face, sit on your hands. Um, we'll be coming up to you and telling you not to do those things and politely, and if you keep doing them, we'll have to ask you to leave. And we don't want to do that, so. So try to sit on your hands. Okay. A lot of accessing methods, obviously visual ones are are big. I mean, a lot. Of, I see people with itchy faces here going to their faces a lot, even now, even after what I said. If anyone else goes to their face, I'm going to have to ask you to leave now. So this is the last morning. That's good. So this man who was concerned that people touching their face would trigger mind control programs himself claims to have been programmed by the Illuminati to commit acts of rape, murder, torture, whatever else at their behest, uh, presumably to spread the mind control programming or to act otherwise in the name of some kind of global conspiracy. As stated in the video, he's a licensed mental health counselor, and what we're concerned with beyond the uh, the provocation of a potential new satanic panic witch hunt is the fact that people who are mentally vulnerable, uh, looking for uh, maybe a more solid grounding in reality, can end up in the hands of somebody like this. Uh, we have a petition uh, against Neil Brick's licensure um, on change.org right now. It's at about, I think, over 1,500 signatures, and we're going to turn it in quite soon. Um, this is really the tinfoil hat fringe, and when I say that, uh, I'm not speaking uh, metaphorically. In fact, in 2011, Neil Brick had somebody speaking at his conference by the name of David Scherter, and I have a video uh, from him here. 
Okay. As a spoiler, he's explaining why he wears a tinfoil hat. There's no way to do this video unscripted. At the point of which I am finding myself, it would be hard for me to make any of this make sense. As you can see, I'm sitting here with a hat stuffed with tin foil in, in it that is covering my ears. And this must seem pretty strange. And you are right. In fact, it is ridiculous that I'm at this point. But let me explain to you why I have tin foil over my ears. For the last couple of weeks, well, actually the last couple of months, I have had pains in my body that I can't explain. I've had bouts of vertigo mixed with waves of nausea, and have found it virtually impossible to sleep, all due to this constant ringing that I have in my ears. Yesterday, I finally went to the emergency room, convinced that I had an ear infection, to be told that my problem was not an infection, but one of the I don't want to show you the whole thing. He kind of babbles on about the, the need of having tinfoil around his head. Uh, but the point is, is that this man, uh, obviously delusional and obviously very disturbed, uh, he speaks at some of these conferences. He spoke at this, uh, this conference uh, for an organization called SMART, also run by Neil Brick, called STOP, uh, an acronym for Stop Mind Control and Virtual Abuse Today. He's also helped organize and spoke for an organization called Ivory Gardens Dissociative Identity Disorder, uh, IGDID. So you have uh, potentially a room full of therapists, and these conferences offer continuing education units for people in the mental health field. You have people helping somebody cultivate their, their delusions and, and taking these things, he's saying, not as case studies of his own insanity, but at face value. So the question then becomes, uh, is this not just a, a something that the mental health licensing oversight has lost track of, and it's a, a fringe that has co-opted the diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder towards its own ends just to justify its conspiracy theories, and in that uh, there is some, some element of the profession of dissociative disorders that uh, doesn't see it this way and there's more to it and there's some empirical validation towards the, the more mundane claims. And for that I would say we should look at the Dissociative Disorders Interview Scale as written by uh, Dr. Colin Ross who helped work with the DSM committee on putting together the diagnostic criteria for what dissociative identity disorder is. And the interview schedule asks questions related to the supernatural possession, ESP experiences, and cults. Have you ever had a supernatural experience? Have you ever had extrasensory perception experiences such as, has you ever, have you ever felt possessed by a demon, dead person, living person, other power or force? Have you ever had contact with ghosts, poltergeists? Have you ever felt you know something about past lives or incarnation spirits? Have you ever been involved in cult activities? Now you could look at that also and you could say that the reality of this isn't important. Uh, Ross maybe was just speaking to people's impressions of this, but who is Colin Ross? Colin Ross, has, uh, as we put on our greatfaction.org little bio of him, he's a past president of an organization called the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, who is the subject of multiple malpractice suits alleging that he cultivated delusions of satanic ritual abuse in his clients. His documented over-medication of one client was adjudged by another doctor to be the worst case of medical malpractice he had ever seen. Ross ran a dissociative disorders unit in Canada since shut down, where he knowingly allowed a known rapist to share the same hospital floors with women, resulting in their being sexually assaulted. Ross is an outspoken government mind control conspiracy theorist who has claimed to possess the paranormal ability of being able to emit beams of energy from his eyes. Um, he manages to get things peer-reviewed studies printed as well, and he did so on his eye beam test. Uh, he actually won the James Randi Pegasus Award because he was trying to win the James Randi Challenge with his paranormal abilities. I wrote a rebuttal to Ross's paper in the journal where he published the paper, um, uh, basically tearing it apart. Um, 
I also did a very uh, a, a very detailed interview with his malpractice patient, Roma Hart, embedded in which I scanned and uh, and embedded uh, all the court documents, relevant court docu documents, affidavits, and, and everything else. Uh, Ross, he uh, he's asked in his book. He wrote a book called The Osiris Complex, where he was he was openly speculating that science should not dismiss ideas of this demonic possession out of hand. And he wrote also about one of his clients who had multiple personalities, a whole fleet of them that would fly overhead the hospital by way of astral projection. I finally caught up with Ross a couple weeks ago. We've kind of had this back and forth for, for years now, and I've written about him. We, uh, Gray Faction, attended a ISST conference. Um, they had already called security, they had called the police, and everybody was kind of clustered around us, but I couldn't help but say hi to him when he was sitting at the hotel restaurant. I thought he had a certain audacity to assume that the cameras were for him. I would have liked to let him know. Maybe I'll let him know via YouTube now. The cameras weren't for you, motherfucker. They were for me. And I'm telling the Colin Ross story. The end game is putting you out of practice. So we were at this conference, and it was for the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, the ISSTD. They are, they describe themselves, they, just, they describe themselves as an international nonprofit professional association organized to develop and promote comprehensive, clinically effective, and empirically based resources and responses to trauma and dissociation and to address its relevant other theoretical constructs, etc. On the face of it, they're a, uh, a respectable professional organization. They also offer continuing education units and they hold their annual, uh, their annual conferences. And um, uh, I'm told by one of the journalists who was talking to me after this event that their, their last reported uh, annual revenue was half a million dollars, which is, is very disturbing. These were some of the flyers, brochures we were putting out when we visited the conference. It gives something of a history of the ISST. It talks about their, uh, uh, their difficult past. Uh, they have a, a whole series of uh, past presidents and, uh, and uh, winners of awards who have who've gone through malpractice suits and promoted uh, deranged conspiracies conspiracy theories about satanic ritual abuse, Illuminati mind control. Um, I wish I had brought some of these pamphlets here, but they're available for download on our greatfaction.org site. Here was something we staged in the middle of the conference while it was taking place. I <laughs>
private area. If you do not see that the sister is not wearing a name badge, it's a private area. You may do protesting outside the building. If you do not protest outside the building, this you will year, call the Fairfax County Police. We have collected the stories of doctors, of patients who are involved with doctors and organizers of ISSTD. These are some of their stories. You cannot pretend you are not the best here. Fairfax County Police is being called. She's just speaking. She's literally just speaking. She knowingly allowed Cleveland to stay on the hospital floor. We need to leave now. Openly medicated and vulnerable women. Dr. Colin Ross, we will never let you forget what you've done. and satanic cults. She was so panicked that she killed him. This is an illegal activity. So Eight-year-old Jude Mira's blood is on your hand. We're going to call the police. Yes, so she's speaking out loud. That would be very interesting. Richard Hicks, you have at least dated your patients and convinced them that they were abused by satanic cults. When they told you that they were not, you completely dismissed them. Richard Hicks, we will never let you forget what you've done. Bessel Vanderpoel, you knowingly published falsified data. The science community will always try to figure out. Bessel Vanderpoel, we will always never let you forget what you've done. It says emergency. Seaburn Fisher, you committed surance fraud, can do your pseudoscience. You admitted this at the 2014 ISSTD conference. Seaburn Fisher, you will never let you forget what you have done. Oh, you could come back. So essentially, we, we sent somebody in there. She was wearing a hospital gown, and she was running through some of the list of the, uh, of the offenders from the ISSTD. Um, but no matter how far you go, it doesn't seem to begin to scratch the surface. The ISSTD harbors a ritual abuse mind control special interest group. Uh, you can find this on their website even. It says the ritual abuse mind control special interest group of the International Society of the Study of Trauma and Dissociation was approved by the ISSTD's Executive Council in 2008. The mission of the Ritual Abuse Mind Control Special Interest Group is to further dialogue, knowledge, research, and training on the etiology, evaluation, and effective treatment of trauma and dissociation clients reporting histories of ritual abuse and mind control, etc. The current uh, head of the uh, Ritual Abuse Mind Control Special Interest Group is a woman by the name of uh, Eileen something or other. Uh, I forget now, but uh, this is a slide from one of her presentations. She's a Christian counselor. She believes in the literal, uh, the literal presence of demons in demonic possession. The, uh, the former secretary of uh, the Ritual Abuse Mind Control Special Interest Group, Jean Reisman, um, she wrote on her blog, I was just looking and just taking a rather cursory glance, so I'm sure there's other great material on there. But I just pulled one quote. It said, it seems that the leaders of the Illuminati meet every 28 years for a whole year, during which Satan appears and tells them what he wants done in the next 28 years. The Illuminati leaders then plan out the actions to be taken and who will do them. The last Feast of the Beast was in 2010, and therefore the next will be in 2038. Uh, this, however, is Ellen Lachter. She was mentioned, you may have heard the woman in the gown uh, talking about her and the death of a child by the name of Jude Mira. Um, Ellen Lachter on her website very openly believes in delusional conspiracies related to uh, Illuminati uh, and witchcraft cults and satanic cults. I, I was interested in an uh, interview she had given that you can find on YouTube where she's saying uh, as a way of, of describing herself as less credulous than some of her peers that she doesn't believe that there is one ultimate conspiracy trying to take over the world because that would simply be crackpot. She believes there are several. Okay. 
And she goes around and finds these things in the woods, and this, this kind of all culminates to her in some kind of narrative of, uh, of these grand plots being, uh, being warred out between these uh, occult conspiracies that are, that are fighting for world domination. In 2010, I believe it was, a woman by the name of Gigi Jordan, um, a multimillionaire from New York, uh, consulted with Ellen Lachter, believing that her autistic eight-year-old son, Jude Mira, was suffering from satanic ritual abuse, and in fact, he wasn't autistic at all, but that his, his problems were simply a manifestation of this belief. Um, we don't know what happened in those sessions with Ellen Lachter, but our position is, is that if Gigi Jordan had 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 sought out and found credible licensed mental health care, she may not have murdered Jude as she did to try to preserve him from a cult that did not exist. We put together a petition um, which got over 2,000 signatures to properly investigate the death of eight-year-old Jude Mira, to investigate the licensing status of Ellen Lachter, and in that petition, we said, we request that Ms. Lacker's possible cultivation of Gigi Jordan's suicidal delusions be investigated for suspicion of gross incompetence, if not abetment of murder, and that her mental competence be professionally evaluated. We are not interested in the testimony of Ms. Lacker's current or past clientele, as it seems a common element of conspiracism is that the imagined revelation of an overarching delusional truth claim can be believed as freeing or healing even while placing one in the subjective universe of suspicion, crippling fear, and hopeless withdrawal from reality. Again, Ms. Lacker's own professional materials are, in our opinion, self-evidently indicative of mental illness and her incompetence as a mental health care professional insofar as her ability to act as an arbiter of ra rational truth claims are of concern. It is our opinion that evidence strongly suggests that Ms. Lacker's mental illness contributed to the murder of an eight-year-old child, Jude Michael Mira. We further contend that the very public nature of Ms. Lacker's delusional claims call into question the confidence in the oversight processes that continue to allow her licensure. We ultimately got a letter back from the California Board of Psychology. I don't know if you can see it, but it says, Dear Mr. Greaves, the California Board of Psychology has completed its investigation regarding the above reference complaint you filed against Ellen Lacker, PhD. Information was gathered from the parties involved and, and experts a name, who is a licensed psychologist, reviewed the case. The expert determined that there was no violation of the laws and regulations related to the practice of psychology with regard to Dr. Lacker's practice or conduct in this matter. Therefore, the board has closed the file. Thank you for bringing this matter to the board's attention. We invite you to complete an enclosed consumer satisfaction survey. <laughs> and the fucking thing isn't even signed. <laughs> So that's where we're at with that. And we are, are planning our next actions of what we can possibly do against the Board of Psychology. Uh, this is such a little recognized problem, and I don't think people realize the degree to which conspiracism and outright delusion is sanctioned with, by organizations like the APA and other mental health oversight boards, and the degree to which this is accepted. In any time you see somebody who specializes in dissociative identity disorder uses regression therapies in the same way that the alien abduction cults will do it, will do the same thing, or past life regression uh, is dependent upon these techniques as well, you know that that's raw quackery, and these people should certainly not have a license to operate. It's our feeling that that this is an egregious violation of the public trust and puts every mental health consumer at risk and if uh, and if anybody's interested in helping with our cause or has any ideas on how we can approach this I would be happy to hear from you and now I will take your questions questions um, uh, if you have any questions just uh, raise your hand and I'll urge you to the mic Thank you for attending our conference, uh, first of all. And then, for those of us who are uh, psychology majors, such as myself uh, and others, how do you think that we can, uh, as uh, secularists and 
skeptics uh, can help. And uh, yeah, that's my question. I think you should be outspoken about it. I think the days are over uh, that they enjoyed during the 80s and 90s in which they were able to fly the banner of, of survivor advocacy, because that's what they do. When you start calling bullshit on ideas of an Illuminati conspiracy theory and this, uh, this ridiculous mind control plot, of trauma-based mind control to cause people to have multiple personalities, um, you are often denigrated as, uh, as uh, setting forward a, a more positive environment for perpetrators. And I think that has actually worked to a large degree for this, this, this particular set to say that at the end of the day, all they're really advocating for are abuse survivors who, who suffer from, uh, from any symptoms of traumatic repression, uh, regardless of where the empirical evidence is for that. Uh, the idea being, of course, that you are re-victimizing victims, which simply doesn't measure up to the case studies when you look and consider how many people have been hurt by the therapy alone, and I really take exception to the idea that accepting the bullshit claim uh, makes you more amenable to recognizing a real problem. If you take the, the uh, daycare abuse scandals that hit during the 1980s, uh, particularly something like the McMartin preschool trial, you'll see that uh, that the, this going down this false avenue of looking for cults that didn't exist uh, may very well have prevented them from finding any type of, of, of criminal activity that may have existed. At the root of it, there was actually a claim that one child had been molested maybe by his father. That ended up being uninvestigated because they were chasing down a satanic cult that wasn't there. And oddly enough, even though they do kind of claim this advocacy for survivors, a man like David Scherter, the one who was wearing the tinfoil hat, he admits to having molested his own nephew. And he, he says that he did this only under mind control. And a guy like Colin Ross, um, he can say he's also a survivor advocate, uh, even while letting a rapist go along on the, on the hospital floors, who then, who then acts upon his, his proclivities. But you'll also see Colin Ross, uh, not too long ago, acting as an expert witness in defense of a rapist, a serial rapist, claiming that uh, uh, apparently he wasn't in control of his own cognitive functions because he had multiple personality disorder. Ross affirmed he had multiple personality disorder, but the claim was thrown out when, uh, when the suspect was caught uh, speaking to his wife or girlfriend from the prison phone, admitting he had faked the symptoms of multiple personality disorder. Next question. Oh, awesome. you're, you're looking for some help. I'm not sure if this would help or not, but um, over the last few decades, a fellow named Joe Nickel with the Center for Inquiry of Buffalo, you know, they would get in and look at claims of the supernatural or the paranormal. Um, would, would they be some way to team up together to try to investigate some of these um, mental health people that are claiming weird, weird stuff? Yeah, yeah Psychop, uh, Skeptical Inquirer, they, they've been pretty good at this. And in fact, uh, uh, Skeptical Inquirer back, I think it was 2008, published an article I wrote about this when I was, uh, when I was reviewing a new book about multiple personality disorder that came out. And this book was claiming that uh, uh, this woman, I think, had it was supposed to be a true story, a biography of a woman named Jenny Hill, now deceased, uh, who had over some hundred personalities, I think it was. And what was really disturbing to me is, again, like with the initial satanic panic, and Michelle remembers, I don't know if anybody's familiar with these types of things, but supernatural horror stories were coming out and being taken as uh, true life accounts of a, of a rare or, or or often unrecognized uh, mental disorder, multiple personality disorder. Uh, Michelle remembers kind of picked off, kicked off the satanic panic, but when you would see uh, the, the subject of that book on talk shows, um, she'd be talking about this as though, you know, this was, this was a, a book about a psychological condition. If you read the book itself, it contains appearances by Satan and uh, the Archangel Michael, and it's told from a very Catholic perspective. Even the book Sybil, where uh, that really kicked off multiple personality disorder craze. 
and, and was discredited by journalist Debbie Nathan recently, who was able to look at the archives of the author and the therapist who put the book together. Um, that book contained an episode of levitation on the part of, of Sybil. And so with this more recent book that had come out that I wrote the review for in Skeptical Inquirer called 22 Faces, it contained prophecy, ESP, uh, divine intervention, Jesus comes down. And yet there were local newscasts in Utah where the author was based talking about this true story, this remarkable true story that had come out. And it was happening all over again. And then, I, so I was already writing about this, and then uh, one of the family members of the woman who was being written about, Jenny Hill, reached out to me and let me know that Dr. Phil was going to do an episode about Jenny Hill and gave me the uh, contacts for his producers. So I reached out to the producers and I, and I told them I, was, I, I had actually read this book and maybe they had it, and if they were going to give this claim any credibility at all, I wanted them to be quite aware of the supernatural claims being made and, that, and hoping that they wouldn't be ignored as far as the show was concerned. Um, they didn't reply, but then I ended up publishing an open letter to Dr. Phil anyway because I wanted something time-stamped that would say, this is what you should have known before you ran this show. This is what I reached out and told you before you ran this show. We don't know what happened behind the scenes, but we do know that the show was delayed for months, and then when it came out, it was weirdly edited and didn't necessarily give a very positive slant to the story at all. But I think we have to be very vigilant on these things and make sure that they don't take off in run amok with the paranoia that we did see in the 80s and 90s, and maybe some people here aren't aware of that, but many people went to prison, had their families and lives ruined in the 80s and 90s in an unrecognized, in a more or less unrecognized now, moral panic that uh, is on the continuum with the witch hunts of old. Here in the United States, people were uh, accused and went to prison based on uh, uh, claims that had no evidence at all and contained items of, of supernaturalism. Uh, next question right here. Uh, not directly related to the therapy issue, but the, the I means that were being read to you. <clears throat> Have you considered trying to press like assault charges in an attempt to get him to admit in court that he doesn't have that power? Or do you think that would accomplish anything at all? <laughs> Oh, you mean he assaulted me with eye beams at the conference when he was staring at me? It's not a bad idea. <laughs> I should talk to my lawyer. I wonder what Ross's reply would be. Um, yeah, good thinking. <laughs> yeah, a local Christian college talks about making eye babies. You can't. Uh, Males and females on campus can't maintain eye contact for too long because they're making eye babies. Um, but thanks for the talk, and uh, I'm really interested in the um, iatrogenic psychiatric disorders and stuff. Uh, uh, there's a lot in the area of sexual offenders and pedophilia that meets a similar kind of moral panic diagnosis. But the issue is trying to prove these things, right? In a dualistic Christian culture, People are going to have delusions of a, as you call it, supernatural variety. So, when, how do you empirically? What's your target here? Is it, you know, uh, is it um, uh, just the, the witch hunts or any supernatural uh, diagnosis at all? Right? Any? Um, are you going to allow any sort of supernatural variable in psychiatry in a dualistic, very non-naturalistic culture? Yeah, I mean, I am very much anti-supernaturalist, and, and I feel that it, it's a, uh, it, I, I think it's it's an incompetence when when somebody um, imposes a supernatural explanation on on anything. I mean, you can indulge those ideas, but I don't think that that's the place of, of anybody in any professional capacity, because by its very nature, that will simply be a matter of speculation and interpretation. And I think all we really have is empirical evidence for things. If the question then, though, is uh, how do we 
trust claims of, of sexual abuse uh, if, if we don't have any evidence for it and maybe somebody was abused but they, they've tapped on delusions of, of supernatural intervention along with it. Um, I think the real problem here is the question of recover memory veracity. Uh, we're not simply talking about claims of sexual abuse that have some delusions tacked onto them. We're also talking about the method by which these claims are brought to surface. And when I would go to, when I first started going to ritual abuse mind control conferences, because I've been doing this for a while, talking to people who believe they were victims of satanic ritual abuse, as well as talking to people who are retractors, uh, like Roma Hart, Colin Ross's patient who was heavily medicated and led to believe she had been abused by satanic cults and doesn't believe she was. Um, now, my, my assumption going in was that these may be people who have suffered abuse and they're not getting the kind of therapy I would think they should get if they're dealing with a therapist who's going to put this uh, a cripplingly paranoid uh, global conspiracy onto their own personal abuse. But as I actually heard these people talk, I began to think more and more, and this might be unpopular, that uh, most of them, if not all of them, had not been abused. And the reason I thought that was because they spoke very openly about coming to this realization. And when people would get up on the stage and they would say that they thought that they had had a normal, happy childhood and that their parents had treated them relatively well until they had gone in and engaged in hypnosis or guided imagery sessions, at which point they realized their family was part of an intergenerational satanic cult, that was horrifying to me because that told me that they had detached themselves from a family that probably wasn't very bad to them at all. So I asked this question a little bit with David. I, when I think about the imagery of, of Satanism, I, I wonder if that like we talk about the irony that first that first article you talked about the M Night Shyamalan movie, the irony of these Satanists coming to this, a conference of people who believe that they've uh, been involved in satanic texts. Why? What, what utility do you believe taking on this, the symbols and aesthetic of Satanism? What what utility does that offer you? Well, it's not just utility. It's something we genuinely identify with. I mean, we may view it as metaphorical, but that doesn't mean we can disentangle ourselves from it in a way where we could rebrand it something else. Uh, a lot of us, and, and I don't know all of us, I don't try to do this to too strictly define it for people who this resonates for. But, uh, you know, I grew up in, in this Judeo-Christian culture and felt the imposition of these, uh, these kinds of norms. And, and I, in my skepticism um, for claims related to conspiracism like the Satanic Panic, um, those, that, that was very much parallel and intertwined with my skepticism over the moral authority of religious institutions. And at a certain point, um, embracing blasphemy can be very powerful and, for lack of a better word, transcendent. And that can become your uh, non-spiritual spirituality. And I, I, for one, just don't feel like I could call myself something other than a Satanist and be honest about it. So when I go out there and I'm representing Satanism and Satanists, um, it is authentic and it is genuine and it may be shocking to people, but I think people should be forced to recognize that these symbols, these metaphors can mean different things to different people and that there are productive people uh, in the world, non-criminal, non-sadistic people who identify with this and they're going to have to start thinking more rationally about things rather than just having knee-jerk reactions to what fealty somebody uh, demonstrates to symbolic norms. Hi, thank you for coming. And um, uh, I have a question, but first for clarification, did you say that, um, what is his name, Colin? Colin Ross. Colin Ross. Did you say that he actually informed the DSM uh, for disassociative identity disorder? Yes, he's deeply respected in the field. That's unbelievable. Uh, so that... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this this question will maybe kind of an obvious answer, but uh, don't you do you think that it's uh, 
the onus is on the psychological community in a way that the psychological community allows for a lot of different uh, belief systems or different uh, you know uh, techniques and uh, you know from psychoanalysis to uh, behaviors to, to the, you know there's there's many different um, forms and do you think this to some extent be allowing for such a wide variety of of forms of of treatment is partially what's allowing this thing to continue and, and why you get a letter like this from from California? Yeah, I, I do think there's far too much latitude on, on, the, on the types of people who can consider themselves a, a therapist or a counselor. And, and I think uh, the APA and other licensing boards should be well aware that people don't understand the difference between a clinical psychologist and a therapist half the time. A therapist can be almost anybody. It can be the delusional, rambling idiot off the street, which uh, really is no different than Neil Brick, or it can be, uh, or it can be somebody with uh, something with a PhD. Uh, Ellen Lactor has a PhD. There's another guy, uh, Randy Noblet, uh, Will Knob, who teaches at Alliant University, the Quack Factory. Um, he's a he's a PhD and also a professor, and he teaches things related to he's done courses related to ritual abuse and mind control. And if you look at his doctoral thesis, it was actually a work related to astrology, uh, the the astronomical concomitants of human behavior, he called it. Um, but I, I really think that at the end of the day, the APA really needs to take ownership of this problem and censure these debunked, provenly harmful therapies. And I think once Gray Faction migrates over from harassing the ISSTD conferences to get some kind of footage and raise people's awareness, and we start going to the uh, APA conferences, uh, my thinking is they might not be willing to embrace us on the face of it because we're the satanic temple, but I think there's going to be a lot of people at those conferences who are embarrassed that we're right, and that they are then going to have that impetus to take some kind of action and realize that they can't ignore this anymore because it denigrates the entire field. A man like Ross still having his practice, it denigrates the entire field of psychiatry, and it's a stain upon the historical record of this practice that it's back in the dark ages. Hey, thanks for being here. A uh, couple comments and a question. I can't help but draw some parallels between Colin Ross and Jim Jones uh, with the eye beam thing. Jim Jones was famous for wearing dark glasses because he claimed that he could burn people alive with his gaze. Um, and second comment, uh, I find it crazy that psychologists are diagnosing people and facilitating therapy um, based on their own delusions and uh, seeing patterns where there are none, which is typical of schizophrenia. Um, but along with the gray faction and what you're doing, do you think that it would help people open their eyes or add to your argument if you were to uh, take a look at the success rates of something like desensitization and reprocessing therapy or cognitive behavior therapy and people who have experienced trauma and kind of add that to your argument? Yeah, and in fact, we've been talking about that. Me and uh, Professor Hood have been talking about going over some of the papers and something we're realizing, and you know, these, these are the kind of papers I'm more likely to look at science paper-wise. So, uh, so I, might, I might just be more critical of psychological papers, but what I feel I'm finding is that there's a, a lot more acceptance for bad data in psychology and psychiatry than in other practices. And when we look at things like EMDR, um, all I can find are papers that say it's better than nothing. And I feel like that's not a good, that's not a good control. Nothing is not a good control. If you're talking that eye movement desensitization therapy, uh, it has some kind of noticeable effect on somebody uh, trying to lessen their trauma, or their electrophysiological response, or however they measure it. Um, you don't compare it against nothing. You should take some kind of other arbitrary activity that's done in the context of confronting the trauma and see if they're the same. If your theory is going to be based upon that there's something unique about the eye movement, then you should do other kinds of movements too and other kinds of 
uh, other kinds of uh, arbitrary activities, as I said, to, to make sure you can distinguish between that placebo and EMDR. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, even though there are studies that show EMDR is better than nothing, which is better than recovered memory therapies that, uh, that, that tend to ruin people's lives and cripple them with delusions, um, you do find a great deal of overlap between people who practice EMDR and people who are in uh, the dissociative identity disorder field. And I don't feel that it's necessarily uh, that the two are, are, are related uh, philosophically as much as they're related uh, by quality of data. These people are, are uh, the people practicing this are less likely to be critical of, of data that doesn't really prove what they're saying. I'm just going to go this way. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so really more of a comment than a question. Um, so um, I've actually known some targeted individuals personally, and one of the hardest things for targeted individuals subject to um, covert harassment is that Nobody believes them, and I realize that you know a lot of the times you know things they say uh, can appear quite paranoid. But again, I think if, if we are truly interested in civil liberties, then it strikes me that um, you know this is really one of the most important and under recognized front lines in the battle for civil liberties. And so, like we know that, for example, the government has a history of covert harassment. You know, uh, whether it be COINTELPRO or um, you know, with the FBI famously trying to persuade Martin Luther King Jr. to commit suicide. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's really important to keep that in mind as well. Believe me, I'm all about those kinds of uh, uh, civil liberties and preserving our privacy. And I am very much an advocate for survivors of abuse. But that is why this offends me so badly. I feel that this discredits people who have legitimate claims of such. Um, I'm not sure what, what claims you might be talking about of, of targeted uh, uh, government uh, spying or whatever else, but I certainly know that abuse exists. And when I have these people who are putting forward clearly bogus claims and then saying me calling them bullshit is, is hurting the victims, I find that so very deeply offensive because I think what they're doing is hurting victims and I think they do so much to discredit people with credible claims. And I, I bet that somewhere in this whole argument of the memory wars, there have been people who have been guilty trying to attach themselves to a false memory argument being put forward. But I think on the balance, the, the, the greatest crime in this whole thing has been done by these advocating for debunked therapeutic practices that have uh, that have not that haven't done anything but make victims. I mean, you you have to look. I, I take it at face value uh, that that I don't have to say anything more about the people who claim to have been abducted by aliens that they suffer from false memories. If you feel like they have been abducted by aliens, I, I don't have much of an argument for you. But I take that at face value that, that they weren't. I, I don't believe that such a thing is happening. And when you see a study like the one that came out of Harvard by uh, Richard McNally that shows that the memories of the trauma of being abducted by an alien, uh, it's script-driven imagery. They can, they can talk out the narrative when, when it's, it, and it gets recorded. And then it's played back to them and they measure their electrophysiological response to see how traumatic it is. They found that these false memories of uh, being abducted by aliens can be just as traumatic as real memories, traumatic war memories, corroborated memories that we know actually happened. So when you have the potential for false memories to be that crippling and to, be, and to turn into real traumas for people and to be cultivated by irresponsible therapists like Colin Ross, uh, that's just, uh, it's just unforgivable that this has gone on so long. I just, can I just speak back on that real quick? I'm, I'm not saying that, um, you know, I, I obviously be opposed to, like, exploitative uh, types of practices, but I'm just saying, like, I know a lot of times, you know, people like that can sound very paranoid, and I think a lot of cases they actually are, but 
Um, I think that um, in at least some of the cases, you know, underlying that is a real case of, of covert harassment. And so I just think, and it can drive people to paranoia. And so I just think, I just wanted to um, highlight that because, you know, again, if we're trying to help people and we're interested in civil liberties and justice and so on, then, you know, it just seems to me that that's an important point to keep in mind. Do the questionnaire every time. Okay, so this is just to kind of satisfy my own morbid curiosity. Um, but why, or do you know why that eight year old boy was murdered? Like, was it just because he was suffering, or was it because they thought he was possessed by demons, or like, I just don't understand. It seems like a really drastic thing to do. He was autistic and he was nonverbal. He could not communicate, he, he could not. Uh, he could not tell people what was wrong with each. He couldn't speak. Um, so there's there's multiple layers of pseudoscience and stupidity that go along with this. Uh, she first, Gigi Jordan first consulted a therapist in Florida by the name of Carol Crow. And by means of facilitated communication, they determined that he had multiple personality disorder. And I don't know if you're aware of what facilitated communication is, but communication, facilitated communication has been debunked long ago. Um, the idea is that, uh, you know, the nonverbal on some, uh, some kind of unconscious level or some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of hidden area of their brain or, or otherwise unexpressed uh, uh, verbal capacity are able, to, uh, are able to type out their answers with just a little aid from somebody who helps facilitate. And you have these people who would claim that they are experienced in reading the muscle movements of the person, uh, the ideomotor response when they put the hand over a keyboard or, or something of the type. And that was what was happening with, with Jude Mira, the eight-year-old autistic boy. And what they found in blind studies is that, wittingly or unwittingly, the facilitators are typing out what they think the correct answer is. And if it's unwittingly, then it's the Ouija board effect. They, they think they feel something, they think they know what the answer already is, and they're helping type it out. In this case, Gigi, the mother, who is clearly a delusional woman, uh, went for help with a delusional therapist, Carol Crow, and was typing out these, uh, these long, insane stories about being abused by a satanic cult. Um, it was after that that Gigi Jordan consulted with Ellen Lachter, Ellen Lachter, who is, a, who is an expert on Illuminati ritual abuse and mind control, and uh, it was altogether too much for Gigi Jordan at some certain point, and she took uh, Jude to a, uh, an expensive hotel, the Peninsula Hotel in New York, where she crushed up some like 20 Xanax and 50 Ambien and put them in, a, in an orange juice vodka concoction. She sat on him and forced it down his throat. He was, he was bruised and, and he, he died, uh, obviously. But her claim was that she was preserving him from further horrors at the hands of this abusive satanic cult, which didn't make sense on the face of it, because by her own admission, she had been with the child all the time, hadn't observed these uh, ritualistic satanic practices. But we contend that if Gigi Jordan had been denied the ability to go to a clinical psychologist who was going to help cultivate these delusions in her, there might have been a different outcome. And we think we deserve a lot fucking better than a letter that just said, we don't think so. That's bullshit. That is bullshit. I have, I, have a, I have a question. So whenever we're talking about the multiple personality disorders and people are going to the doctor to get, um, you know, help for their trauma, like are they going with delusions or are the delusions being implemented within the, the regress? Because I think there's like a difference between um, Dr. Williams' question and then like what's happening if I'm understanding your talk correctly, because normally it's coming from sexual to childhood abuse, correct? And that's where the traumas are coming from, or are there more? Well, the claim is that it comes from childhood sexual trauma, okay. but that's never really been put to the empirical test, and that's something we're also going to put together a bad data page on grayfaction.org where we talk about the empirical basis for this idea. Really, the idea came first with the discredited uh, uh, the, it had its predecessors, but really came into prominence with the story of Sybil 
and she was supposed to be so heavily abused that her, her personality's fractured off, and it has this uh, correlate with, with Freudian theory and everything else. The, uh, but the problem is, if for the most part, you have a bunch of retrospective surveys, and I've kind of taken to now comparing this to other retrospective surveys that prove other things that are clearly not true. And again, you take things like alien abduction, and uh, no apologies for anybody who might actually believe it. But um, they, they take a, gr a group of the people who believe that this happened to them, they give them multiple choice questions, then they quantify the common, commonality of the answers, and they'll say, well, 90% of respondents agreed with this, uh, and then they take this as evidence of the phenomenon. So uh, essentially the, the, the surveys are taking for granted that the phenomena exists and then using the data to, to use circular logic to say that it is so. And we're also finding bad data for the, uh, the idea of massive repression, that people uh, repress full, uh, full lifetimes of episodic abuse. Um, and we're finding that sometimes data is used that doesn't say anything of the type to prove that it's so. Uh, recently I was looking at a study from somebody from the ISST, uh, Constance Dallenberg, and she did a, a survey of people where she was, uh, they, had, they had confirmed case histories of abuse and found out uh, later that upon probing for more answers they were able to find uh, more details about that abuse, and then using that to say, well, there was repression of these episodes. But that doesn't speak to anything other than the fact that if you work at it, you might remember more details of an event. Uh, it doesn't say anything against the idea of regular forgetting or that an entire history of abuse can be, uh, can be entirely repressed like that. I forgot your question. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, good you. There's a few back here. And we'll do like uh, this and then we'll be done because there'll be seven, okay? Have you been able to make any connections between the religious religiosity of these uh, psychologists or claiming uh, all the satanic ritual abuse? And uh, that is, do you look into their background? Does that matter or does that take to affect how they, uh, how they diagnose their, their patients? Well, I would like to be able to stand here and tell you that this is a problem of Christian counselors imposing a cosmic vision of, of Christ's own people against Satan. But that's just not the case. This is a, the, uh, this was really able to take off. The Satanic Panic was, was able to take off because elements of the left and the right were happy to come together to fight a non-existent threat. And, and you would have like the anti-pornography feminists that felt that there were there was uh, a, a complete uh, failure to notice abuse and trauma, child abuse and abuse of women, um, that were pushing for this kind of uh, survivor narrative that any claim of abuse needs to simply be validated, no matter how ludicrous it is, and that works perfectly well with people who want to claim that we are in a cosmic battle with a satanic conspiracy that is using trauma-based mind control to, uh, to cause people to have multiple personalities. And that works quite well with the cottage industry of, of psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists who feel like they have one answer for every problem every time somebody comes in and that somebody was abused uh, whether there's evidence for it or not. Um, so there was, a, there was a real confluence of interests that led to one of the most irrational moral panics of our time. And unfortunately, I didn't see, there was no real censure uh, after the fact. You know, there's, there's been a lot of exposition and you're not going to see uh, things like the Geraldo specials that were coming out in the 80s. You're not as likely to see them now but I could see them happening again very soon in the, in the Trump era where people were fucking stupid enough to believe this pizza gate shit. Goodness. Thank you. So you mentioned that there are these issues where we have these sets of questions and we don't verify the actual truth claim uh, as far as the abuse or the satanic ritual abuse. 
So I guess this question kind of goes back to maybe the 80s or earlier when the original satanic panic began. Were there any legitimate instances of what appeared to be uh, satanic ritual abuse or any corroborated claims or, or, or anything that might have got this thing rolling to where people actually believe that there's some truth to this whole thing? Well, there's an interesting kind of social phenomenon when uh, uh, there was an author uh, by the name of Cohn, and I think his book is called, uh, or Cohen, and I think his book was called Moral Panics, and I think he kind of, uh, he kind of set the tone for that research. Uh, I think his book was, uh, yeah, his book was published in the 60s, and it was about the, uh, the mods and the, uh, and the other faction in Britain that was against them. And what was happening in that situation was that you, you had these two kind of hipster elements that were supposed to be imbalanced with one another and at war. And the media rather created it. It didn't. It wasn't really happening. There weren't these fights on the streets, but there was this panic about uh, the mods and the whoever else. Uh, I, I don't know the hip, uh, British subculture from the '60s. Um, but what happened was people started acting some of these things out, and uh, we didn't find. We certainly didn't find any cases that would fit the satanic ritual abuse narrative where you have an intergenerational cult uh, traumatizing somebody with the express purpose of mind controlling them into having multiple personalities that harbor specific programs. Of course we found nothing like that. But you do have cases like there was a kid named Sean Sellers in the 1980s who they all flocked to uh, once he was willing to blame Satanism for what he had done, which was murder a convenience store clerk and murder his parents. Uh, he got away with murdering the convenience store clerk and three months later murdered his parents and these two crimes were put together. And he claimed that Satanism made him do this. He was on the Geraldo shows and they were talking about how this was evidence of this vast conspiracy. But what wasn't really pointed out was that there were no accomplices in this conspiracy. He was a satanic cult of one and he wasn't even acting upon any type of creed that was sanctioned by any group of self-identified Satanists. He was growing up in the Bible Belt under strict Christian parents, and he was obviously reacting to what the idea of Satanism was supposed to be. And I think you saw similar with Richard Ramirez. He was enamored of Anton LaVey, um, and we're not LaVeyan, but still, nonetheless, I don't think there was anything in LaVey's writing that could legitimately inspire what Ramirez had done, he was simply willing to be the monster the media wanted him to be. There was a, an element of self-aggrandizement in that. So I do think that this idea of a satanic conspiracy uh, can generate uh, a, a kind of model for antisocial behavior that uh, we're happy to destroy with what we do. And it's another element of why I feel we should probably be unapologetic for identifying how we do, no matter how jarring it is to people around us or how antisocial they think it is. I honestly think it has a deeply pro-social value. Any questions? Okay, well, can we all give uh, Mr. Lucian Green's